Holmond Abbey is a ruined medieval monastery in the care of English heritage. Join us now as we explore these romantic ruins and share its history. According to the cartulary of the Abbey, Humond was founded in 1100 AD, the last year of the reign of King William Rufus and the first year of the reign of King Henry I by William Fitz Owen. Two papal bulls of Pope Alexander III designating him as the founder of the aforementioned place, but this is disputed. In an 1856 study of Harmon's origins, the Victorian historian of Shropshire, R. W. Iton, considered the cartulary evidence, pointing out that it was impossible for all the established facts to be true, as William Fitzalp is known to have been still a youth in 1138, when he became involved in the anarchy of Stephen's reign. Moreover, of the two papal bulls concerning the abbey issued by Alexander III in 1172, one does not mention the foundation at all, while the other one does attribute it to William Fitzalan, but does not give a date. William Fitzalan took the side of the Empress Matilda during the war known as the Anarchy, and was exiled from 1138 until at least 1153. However, grants to the Abbey continued in Fitzalan's absence. The Empress gave Hormond land and a mill in Shropshire. The land grant at least is generally thought to date from Matilda's time but the Abbey took the precaution of getting Stephen's approval for these valuable gifts. When Henry, Duke of Normandy, the future Henry II, appeared in England in 1153, he was induced to issue a charter at Leicester, confirming his mother's grants. An early benefactor of Harmond was Reynolds de Gurnon, the fourth Earl of Chester, who donated the right to fish in the River Dee and take 6,000 saltfish free of tolls. In 1155, the year after Henry II took the throne, his supporter, William Fitzalan, finally regained his Shropshire estate. William then donated the church at Roxeter to Hormond. As the wealth of the abbey increased, the rebuilding of the church and abbey was begun. Over the next 20 years, it was constructed in a late Romanesque style, funded mainly by the Fitzalans and their vassals, especially the Lestrange family. However, there were royal donations, including assarts around the abbey site, which were granted by an early charter of Henry II. After about 20 years of fundraising, William's son, William Fitzalan II and the new abbot began a major campaign of reconstruction. Over the next quarter of a century or more, they replaced almost all prior buildings, creating a 64 metre long church and three new ranges of buildings, including a chapter house, refectory and library. Running southwards from the cloister, was a huge 40 metre long dormitory which could have housed at least 24 cannons. By about 1350 the abbey was complete with its great church and main cloister to the north and a kitchen cloister and abbot's hall to the south. The 
Appy was subject to canonical visitation by the Bishop of Lichfield in the early 1300s. He criticised administrative and moral failings. For example, the obedientries who collected rents and tithes were instructed not to travel alone, and canons residing away from the abbey were ordered to be recalled. The canons were also criticised for their love of hunting. For most of the abbey's history, the criticism were few and infrequent and it is likely that the monastic discipline was generally reasonably good. More serious criticisms came late in the history of the Abbey, during the time of two abbots, Richard Ponsonbury and Christopher Hunt. Richard Ponsonbury was abbot from 1488 to about 1521. His failings seem to have been mainly in management of both resources and people, revealed in visitations in 1518 and in 1521. Because revenues were being misapplied, the buildings needed repair, particularly the infirmary, dormitory, chapter house and library. Ponsonbury seems to have complained about this to the bishop, as if he himself were not responsible for the mismanagement. Monastic life was suffering because of lack of instruction for the novices, and worse still, a woman of ill repute was spending time at the abbey, and there were boys in the dormitory. Ponsonbury was replaced by Christopher Hunt, but in 1522, his successor was accused of fornication, as well as incompetence and neglect. He admitted to fornication, but claimed he had already performed penance. Nevertheless, he was sent to Illshaw Abbey to be disciplined, and it was said that he was much improved on his return. However, Hunt managed to get the Abbey into a debt by £100, a considerable feat considering its excellent revenues and low running costs. Between 1527 and 1529 he disappeared from the scene and was replaced by Thomas Corvessa, who had been his chaplain and one of his sternest critics. Corvessa seems to have restored the abbey's finances and reputation. He remained abbot until the dissolution. In 1839 the abbey was closed during Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. The canons lost their roles and their home, but received state pensions and could seek work as church priests. Three years after its dissolution, the abbey was purchased by Sir Rowland Hill, a wealthy merchant who came from Shropshire. In the 1550s, his nephew, James Barker, demolished the church and dormitory but kept the Grand Abbot's Hall, kitchen block, west end of the refectory and chapter house, converting the buildings into a Tudor mansion with courtyards and walled gardens. The mansion was damaged in the 1640s during the Civil War and in 1652 this once grand house was leased as a farm. The Corbett family inherited the estate in 1740 and they began to adapt the old buildings into a landscape garden for their home, Sundorn House, a mile to the west. By dismantling some of the Tudor additions, the Corbetts created a Gothic feature, a real medieval ruin, for their picturesque garden. Modern visitors arrive at the Abbey ruins using the 18th century main road and enter the site through the rear gate built by the Corbetts. The ruins of the abbey are picturesque and are a great place to get a sense of life inside a medieval abbey. It is a free site to enter, though I feel perhaps English heritage should be charging a small fee as there is a lot to see and maintain. To help keep history alive, like, subscribe and share this video out there.
and I'll see you all next time. Until then, goodbye.